In this video, we'll begin looking at the largest animal phylum, the arthropoda. This group includes something like 85% of described species of animals, including these larvae of a branchiopod crustacean, Artemia. We'll organize the living arthropods according to this basic phylogenetic structure, which includes three main clades. These are the chelicerates, sea spiders, horseshoe crabs, ticks, spiders, and many other groups, the myriapods, centipedes and millipedes mostly, and the largest group, the pancrustacea. This includes the traditional crustaceans, crabs, shrimps, barnacles, that sort of thing, as well as the hexapods, insects and their close relatives. Hexapods are really just derived crustaceans, so the old taxon crustacea is paraphyletic with respect to hexapods. To introduce arthropods, we'll look at members of two crustacean groups, the brine shrimp Artemia and two decapod crustaceans, a shrimp and a crab. Let's start with the brine shrimp Artemia. These are really easy to collect since if conditions are right, females produce embryos with a thick protective coating. Those stop developing around the gastrula stage and can remain alive that way for several years. When you add water, they hatch out as Nauplius larvae. You can buy cysts from aquarium supply shops since Nauplius larvae are good food for many small fishes and suspension feeding invertebrates. Here are some dry cysts. These are often called eggs, but they're actually embryos. The zygotes have undergone quite a few rounds of cell division already. About 24 hours after you add water, Nauplius larvae hatch out and begin swimming and feeding. You can see a bunch of empty cyst walls on the bottom of the dish as well. These larvae swim a little too fast to see much in terms of structure. Here's a Nauplius in ventral view. At the anterior end, you can see the single Nauplier eye. They have three pairs of appendages, the short, relatively immobile first antennae at the anterior end, the large, rapidly moving second antennae, and posterior to those, the smaller mandibles. In this ventral view, you can also see a big flap that covers over the mandibles. That's called the labrum. It's basically like a long, extended upper lip covering over the mouth. And here's a larva in dorsal view. You can't see that ventral labrum as clearly now, of course. If you look at the dorsal part of the head at higher magnification, you can see the contractions of the muscles that are operating those three pairs of appendages. To see those appendages and swimming a little more clearly, it helps to slow down footage. I took this through a microscope objective with my cell phone camera, which I think does about 25% actual speed. You can see that the first antennae don't seem to be involved in swimming at all. And about halfway through the active stroke of the second antennae, the mandibles seem to start a recovery stroke. I'm guessing that the mandible movements are intended to gather food and move it to the mouth, and they're not actually very involved in swimming. As these feed and increase in size via a series of molts, they add segments and eventually reach adulthood. Here are some adults.
Here's a female on the left and a male on the right. These have three body regions, an anterior head, a thorax with all those swimming appendages, and an abdomen, which doesn't have any paired appendages at all. Here's that female. You can see two large black compound eyes at the anterior end, and in between them you can faintly see the single noplier eye. The tube running from anterior to posterior that's filled with some yellowish material is the digestive system. The anus is at the very posterior end on the telson. Though you can't separate them all out, the head has five pairs of appendages, the thorax has 11 pairs of appendages, and the abdomen has eight segments but no appendages. You can see lots of blood cells flowing around in the hemocele of the abdomen. Here's a ventral view of the female's head. The thin cylindrical antennae are the first antennae. Those that are more flattened are the second antennae. Posterior to those, you see the two compound eyes, and posterior to that, you can see the mandibles gnashing against each other. Their surfaces that contact each other are brownish, and of course you can see lots of blood flowing through the hemocele. The thoracic appendages are all phyllopodous or flattened appendages. They're used for swimming, for feeding, and probably also for gas exchange. This is the ovisac, which in this female contains numerous yellow embryos. Here's that male in dorsal view. It looks like he has only one pair of antennae, the first antennae, but the second pair are actually very large and oriented ventrally. Males use those second antennae to grasp females during mating. Those two U-shaped structures at the junction of the thorax and abdomen are the vas deferens. You've seen a lot of blood cells moving around in the bodies of these animals. That blood is being circulated by the heart, which is a long dorsal tube with pairs of holes or ostea in each segment. You can see that pretty well in the abdomen of adult artemia. Here's the male's abdomen and dorsal view. You can see the intestine with food in it. Look carefully just below the intestine to the animal's left, and you'll see a very thin-walled, transparent, contracting tube. That is the heart. It should be just dorsal to the intestine, but I've squished this animal a bit under a cover slip, and the heart moved to the animal's left, which is great. It makes it much easier to see. You can see the heart much better at higher magnification. In this view, you can see four sets of ostea opening and closing on the sides of the heart, one pair for each segment. And here is a single pair of ostea opening and closing. and another pair a little more posterior. Each time they open, a few blood cells enter and are propelled towards the anterior, which is towards the left. And here's a single pair of ostea. Now slowed down to about a quarter normal speed.
Now let's look at a couple of malacostriguns. Members of this huge group usually have five pairs of head appendages, eight pairs of thoracic appendages, and six pairs of abdominal appendages. The head and thorax are sometimes fused into one region, the cephalothorax, which is true in the two species we'll look at. First, let's look at a shrimp. I didn't find live ones at the time I needed to film this, so let's go with previously frozen white shrimp farmed in Ecuador. Here is the abdomen, and here is the cephalothorax. You can see that the body is laterally compressed when you look at it in ventral or dorsal view. The tail fan has two components. The middle pointy bit, the most posterior, is the telson, and on either side of it are a pair of biramus appendages coming off of the sixth, the last, abdominal segment. Here are all of those abdominal segments and their biramus appendages, counting from the back. Sixth, fifth, fourth, third, second, first. Here are those paired left and right abdominal appendages in a bit more detail. Interior to those are the thoracic appendages, of which there are eight pairs. The posterior five pairs are used for walking mostly. Those are called periapods. Counting from the back, appendage eight, seven, six, five, and four. The first three pairs of thoracic appendages are used to manipulate food and are called maxillopeds. Those are harder to see unless you tear them out. So let's remove all the appendages from one side of the body. We'll start at the back by removing the six abdominal appendages on this animal's left side. Then those periapods. Thoracic appendage three is called maxilliped three. Here it is. And anterior to that is maxilliped 2. Here it is. And anterior to that is maxilliped 1, which I removed while looking at this with a dissecting microscope. I also took out the three posterior head appendages, maxilla 2, maxilla 1, and mandibles. Here are all those lined up with anterior appendages to the left. All we're missing here are the two most anterior head appendages, the first and second antennae. And here's a guide to where these come from on the body. There are only three head appendages here since I didn't pull off the two pairs of antennae, but there are eight thoracic appendages and six abdominal. Here are those nice biramus abdominal appendages. And here are the eight thoracic appendages. The most anterior three on the left are maxillopeds one through three, and the posterior five are the periapods. 
And here are the three posterior head appendages from anterior to posterior, mandible, maxilla 1, and maxilla 2. The business part of the mandible looks like a molar. The left and right parts of that crush food between them. And the second maxilla has a big flat part. That's called the scaphognathite or the gill baler. It generates a water current over the gills. And here are those two first pairs of head appendages still on the body. The second antenna, which has a large flat part called a scale at its base. And the tiny first antennae. The cephalothorax is covered with a sheet of cuticle called the carapace. Underneath that, on the left and right sides, are the gills, which are extensions of the bases of the periapods. The animal pumps water over those using that flat outgrowth of maxilla 2, the scaphognathite. These white structures are the gills. I didn't have access to living Pinaeus, but I did get a little footage of living spot prawns just to show you that scaphognathite in action. Here's one in a seafood store tank. And here's another. The carapace is translucent enough that you can see that waving scaphognathite inside the gill chamber. It's pumping water out anteriorly, which draws water in at the bases of the periapods and causes it to flow over the gills. Okay, one more malacostrican, the yellow rock crab. I bought this at a local seafood store. The fishery is based here in Southern California, so it's reasonably local. This crab looks pretty different from the shrimp we just saw, but the body is organized in exactly the same way. You can see the two pairs of antennae here clearly. The longer ones are the first antennae, and the shorter ones that are flicking are the second antennae. In dorsal view, you mostly just see carapace, which in contrast to shrimp is not compressed laterally, it's expanded laterally. You can also see the five pairs of periapods, thoracic appendages four through eight, the first of those, thoracic appendage 4, ends with a pair of pinchers called keely. If you look ventrally, you can see the abdomen. It's folded under the cephalothorax. Most of the cuticle in this crab is much more calcified than it is in either brine shrimp or pineus, so the arthrodial membrane, regions of the cuticle where it is very thin to allow bending between articles of appendages, is much more obvious. Here is arthrodial membrane between articles of that fourth thoracic appendage. You can see that it's very soft and flexible. If you unfold the abdomen, you can see the telson at the very posterior end. The anus opens onto the telson. In fact, there's a bit of feces showing where the anus is. The last part of the digestive system is this clear tube. You can also see the paired abdominal appendages, but there are only four pairs. This is a female, and in this type of crab, females have lost appendages on the first and sixth abdominal segments, so they only have appendages on segments two, three, four, and five. Here's the abdomen viewed dorsally. I'm holding the telson, and you can see six segments anterior to that. And here's the crab in side view. Just to emphasize that when the abdomen is out like this, it's basically just a weird shrimp. Here are the periapods, thoracic appendages 8, 7, 6, 5, and 4.
and here is thoracic appendage 3, otherwise known as maxilliped 3, which is big and broad. And here are the paired first antennae, and the paired second antennae. To see the other maxillipeds and the maxillae and mandibles, you have to remove appendages just like we did for the shrimp. Here goes maxilliped 3. And here is maxilliped 2. and maxilliped 1. Here are maxilla 2, maxilla 1, and the mandible. Here I'm removing maxilla 2, which has a scaphognathite, just like in the shrimp. Maxilla 1 is a lot easier to remove. I didn't remove the mandible, though you can see how it moves here. It basically just grinds against the mandible on the opposite side, breaking up food. So just to walk through thoracic and head appendages again, thoracic appendages 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, those are the periapods, Thoracic appendages 3, 2, and 1. Those are the maxillipeds. Maxilla 2 and maxilla 1. The mandible. and antenna 2, and antenna 1. The hole where I pulled the scaphognathite from is where water exits the gill chamber. The gills are in there, of course. To see them, you have to cut away the carapace.
Here's the inside of the gill chamber. You can see a long white structure. That's actually an outgrowth of Maxilla ped 1 and it's used to clean the gills in the gill chamber. Here are the five gills on the animal's left side. They are outgrowths of the bases of the five periapods. I opened up the rest of the carapace to look inside the body. The thin skin over the body is the epidermis that secretes the cuticle. Under the epidermis, you can see a large white structure with a hole on each side. That is the heart. The bright red tissue is ovary. And that brown tissue is digestive gland. Let's end with a scene of happier times for this crab.